Welcome to JaguarAudioDesign.com. My name is Darren, and this segment is all about turntable setup. Now, if you've ever thought that setting up a high-performance turntable might be difficult, confusing, or expensive, I'm going to go through this step by step. And when we're done, you're going to have everything you need to even set up a table like this one. Our demonstration subject is a Triangle Art Signature Turntable. This is a 12-inch Triangle Art Ebony Tone Arm, and the cartridge is also a Triangle Art. Now, this is about a $30,000 setup, not including this LAM phono preamplifier. It's a relatively complex design in that the motor and the Tone Arm Tower are completely separate from the main unit. Now, I would say that about 97% of turntable designs are either equally or more likely less complicated than this one. So if you can set up this table, you can probably set up just about anything on the planet. And I'm going to show you that it's really not that difficult. Before you do any setup, I want you to give some thought to where you're going to locate your turntable. It should be on a very stable and sturdy base like this. All the parts should be secured to the base very well just in case somebody accidentally comes up and bumps it or there's an earthquake. And also be mindful of vibration coming from your subwoofers and your speakers, whether it's up through the ground or airborne vibration. We want to limit that as much as possible because it can have a negative effect on the performance of the turntable. Let's take a quick look at this light that I'm using. This is an LED light and it's really perfect for this operation because I can twist it and bend it in just about any direction that I want. It doesn't matter what kind of light you use, but the main thing is you want a lot of light and you need to be able to get it into the areas where you're working because we're going to be doing some very delicate operations on some really small objects and make it easy on yourself. Give yourself as much light as possible so you can see what you're doing and do it correctly. Just a few more things before we get started. You're going to really want to scour all the instruction manuals that come with your gear for any setup specific instructions. For example, this particular turntable model calls for two drops of synthetic motor oil to be added with the bearing during assembly. If you put 10 drops in there, you're going to have a problem down the road. So it really pays to study the instructions carefully and make sure that you do everything correctly. It's not a bad idea to contact the manufacturer or distributor and ask them if they have any tips for you before you get started. And whenever I'm working with new gear, I like to disassemble and reassemble everything a few times just so I have a good understanding of how it all goes together and how it works. The base for this tone arm has about a dozen different knobs and adjustment screws. So by spending some time with it early on, I know exactly what each of those screws does. And when I'm in the middle of trying to install the tone arm, it just makes the setup process go much more smoothly. And as a bonus, because you're going to need several tools for these jobs, in this case, a screwdriver and several of these little Allen wrenches, I know exactly what I need before I get started. And I've got it all set aside and ready to go. And with that, we're ready to move on to the first step. I'm going to go ahead and level everything now using this little bubble level. I got this at the hardware store for $6. I'd stay away from the two $3 levels on Amazon or eBay, but I've seen these also in record stores and hi-fi shops for $60, $80. Bucks. And I can tell you this is every bit as accurate as the $80 version. On this turntable, I'm going to level the motor right here on top of the pulley. I'm going to level the tone arm tower, and I'm going to level the platter. Now, most of you are going to be using a one-piece unit, in which case you'll level everything all at once with the platter. And I'm going to show you the simple steps to do that. This platter has three adjustable footers, which is pretty typical. So I'm going to place the level here, adjust the first one, 
the second one, and the third one. Then I'm going to go back and do it all a second time. And for the final touch, I'm going to focus right here where the cartridge is going to travel. I'm going to try to get that as perfect as I possibly can. After you do that, everything is level. Let's take a quick look at the various parts of the tone arm and cartridge. On the back end of this tone arm are two counterweights, one large and one small. The wood part is known as the wand. At the end of the wand is a round brass piece called the head shell. The cartridge mounts to the head shell with a pair of small nuts and bolts. The white part of this cartridge is called the body, and the piece under the body, commonly referred to as the needle, is what's known as a cantilever. At the end of the cantilever is a small diamond or similar substance that rides on the surface of the record. This is the stylus. We're about to go on to the tone arm adjustments, but before we can do that, I need to remount the cartridge and reinstall the tone arm. The cartridge is going to mount right here on what we call the head shell, using these bolts that are going to go down through the top and then a small nut on the bottom to tighten everything up. We want it to be tight, but we don't want it to be too tight because we don't want to break anything. At the end of the tone arm, we have four color-coded wires. And if you look at the cartridge, the contact points are also color-coded. Now, if you don't have the color coding, make sure you go back to your manual after you connect everything and just confirm that all the wires are in the correct position. Before I connect any of the wires, I like to use a little bit of this Deoxit D5 contact cleaner. And then I'll also paint a little metallic contact enhancer over each of the points. So I'm going to go ahead and do all that. And when we come back, we'll move on to the next step. There are two types of cartridge designs, moving magnet and moving coil. This is a moving coil cartridge, characterized by high sensitivity, but also a much lower output. The cartridge is costing about $2,000 and above or almost exclusively moving coil. However, in the low to medium price products, moving magnet and moving coil can be equally good. Now this issue of output is something that we should focus on. Some phono preamplifiers are only capable of playing a moving magnet. The main thing is we want to make sure that the cartridge has enough output for the rest of the system. Now, I can't tell you a specific number to shoot for because there are many factors in the equation, such as the sensitivity of your speakers, the wattage of your amplifier, and so forth. But for example, if you're using a moving coil unit with a manufacturer's output rating of 0.5 millivolts, and you're already cranking the volume, if you decide to switch that out for something in the 0.3 to 0.2 millivolt range, you're going to have a significant reduction in volume. And for that reason, it's important to pay attention to the cartridge manufacturer's output ratings. As the cartridge travels across the record grooves, the stylus will point at slightly different angles on different parts of the album. You'll hear terms like Lofgren A, also known as Bearwald, Lofgren B, and Stevenson. These refer to different types of cartridge geometries, essentially where the cartridge falls on the album and which direction it's pointing. And this creates a lot of confusion. Ideally, what we want is for the stylus to point as close to the center of the record groove for as often as possible, producing the least amount of total distortion. In general, Lofgren A is the best choice for the lowest distortion. If you feel like experimenting, you may try Lofgren B for a while, and I'd avoid Stevenson altogether. We'll take a look at how to do this setup with a protractor in just a moment. Before I make any changes to the cartridge geometry, I'm going to set the spindle distance. Spindle distance refers to the distance between the spindle and the pivot point of the tone arm. There are a couple ways to do this setting. This turntable calls for a distance of 191 millimeters and I did the measurement using a tape measure. I took my time to make sure that I get it as exact as I possibly can. Now the only reason why I'm doing this setting is because 
This particular turntable has a tone arm tower that's completely separate from the rest of the table. Most of you will be using a turntable that has a fixed tone arm base, which means you can't move or adjust the tone arm base in any way. If that's the case, then you won't do this step. I have two types of protractors here. This one is called the GeoDisc, and this one is printed on a piece of paper from a free software known as the Conrad Protractor Generator. By the way, I have a post on the Jaguar blog page that shows where to download the software and how to use it. When I set this protractor on the platter, I want this ridge line to sight right down to the pivot point of the tone arm located right here. I've mounted the cartridge to the head shell and I've loosened it a little bit so that I can make adjustments. And when I drop the arm on the protractor, the first thing I want to do is ensure that the stylus falls right in the center of this little white circle. In order to do that, I'm probably going to have to move the cartridge body either forward or backward. This is called setting the overhang. Once the overhang is correct, I'll twist the cartridge body either to the left or to the right. Um, and I want the cantilever to align right along the center line that runs through the center of the circle that I mentioned. Notice I said the cantilever and not the cartridge body. This is because it's not uncommon for the cantilever to be slightly off angle in relation to the body. Once I've got everything where I want it, I'm going to tighten it all down carefully to ensure that I don't lose my settings. If I were to do this with the $250 Fiker protractor, the setup would be faster and easier. But at the end of the day, the spindle distance, the overhang, and the cartridge geometry are going to be exactly the same whether I use an expensive protractor or the piece of paper. So for that reason, don't feel like you need to spend a lot of money to get this right because in this case, spending money is not going to buy you improved performance. I've reinstalled the cartridge and the tone arm, so now I'm going to set the tracking force using this digital scale. Don't use the old-fashioned manual scale because they're not accurate enough, but I got this one on Amazon for about $25 and I put it up against a $200 jeweler scale and this one for our purposes is every bit as accurate and consistent. I've got the stylus or the needle in the center of the scale and I'm going to set the amount of downward force by adjusting the weight on the back of the tone arm. This is one time where you should be very focused because if you're not paying attention to what you're doing you could very easily break the stylus. Usually it happens when you're trying to tighten the weight, the tone arm goes flying, and who knows what happens after that. This cartridge calls for 2.0 grams of downward force. Most manufacturers will give you a range of about plus or minus 5%. If you set it with more force, you're going to gain a bit more of a solid foundation, whereas if you subtract it, go towards the lower end of the spectrum, you're going to lose some of that foundation, but you'll gain more of a airy nuance character. Now we're going to set the speed of the turntable using this test disc. It's called the Ultimate Analog Test LP. And this is the first of several steps in which we're going to use tracks off this disc to run the setup. I'm going to play the last track on the first side and the way that it works is when the turntable is spinning at exactly 33 and a third RPM, the speaker will emanate a frequency of exactly 3,150 hertz. I have a free app loaded on my phone called Platter Speed. It works with Android and iPhone, and the app will listen to the frequency coming out of the speaker. If the frequency is too high, I need to lower the speed of the platter, and if it's too low, I'm going to raise it. Let's run the measurement and I'll show you how it works. I have the motor controller speed set to 33 and a third RPM. As I play the test tone, the Platter Speed app will measure the average speed as well as how much it deviates up and down. To set the speed for 45 RPM, I'll switch the controller to 45 and play the track again. 
The app will automatically detect the adjustment to 45 RPM. The next two steps we're going to cover are by far the most debated and most confusing steps in this entire process. The reason they're confusing is because they're widely misunderstood as being much more complicated than they actually are. The first of these steps is azimuth. Now azimuth is nothing more than aligning the stylus straight up so it's 90 degrees perpendicular to the surface of the record. Therefore we'll get equal output out of the left and the right channels. I'm going to show you a method by which we can do this setup visually. For this next step, I'm going to use a standard CD. I'm going to drop the arm on it. Now my goal here is to get a perfect mirror image of the stylus as I look at it head on. Remember, the stylus is just the diamond at the end of the cantilever. It's very tiny, so I'm going to use this jeweler's loop. You can get these on eBay for about five bucks. This is a 40x magnification, but when they're this powerful, it's difficult to focus, so I recommend you use something closer to 20x. If you have a strong magnifying glass on hand, that's probably suitable as well. This tone arm has a couple set screws right here, and when I loosen those, I can twist the tone arm and the entire cartridge either clockwise or counterclockwise. I'll go back and forth a few times until I get it as close as I possibly can. And I'll guarantee that if you can get the mirror image as close to perfect as possible, you're not going to hear any asymmetry in the sound. However, for those of you who just have to measure the results if there's a way to do so, I'm going to show you how to do that next. We're about to move on to measuring azimuth using the test disc, but before we do this, I want to mention that if you happen to have a tone arm that doesn't allow for adjusting azimuth, check your cartridge for a ridge running across the top of the body which will allow you to tilt it to the left or to the right as you tighten down the screws. If you don't have a ridge, you can create one by taping a piece of pencil lead across the center of the body. Now I have my funnel preamp turned around and I want to take a moment to show you the jacks on the back panel. The phoner interconnect is currently connected to the moving coil inputs because I'm using a moving coil cartridge. However, if I were using a moving magnet cartridge, I would connect to these jacks here, and then I would flip these little switches from moving coil to moving magnet. On the outside, I have two more RCA jacks. These are outputs, which will uh, use an interconnect to go from the funnel preamp to the line stage preamplifier. I also have two grounding posts over here. Uh, this little wire going from the phono interconnect to this post called phono ground is grounding the entire tone arm to the ground plane of the component. The second ground post below there is called earth and that's intended to run a wire to a separate grounding device or to the ground post of an electrical outlet. This particular preamp doesn't have any loading adjustment knobs. Some manufacturers believe in adjustable loading and others don't. So if you have adjustment knobs for loading on your component, then look up the specs for your cartridge and set the loading accordingly. And if you don't, then don't worry about it. Now, when it comes to actually measuring azimuth, there are a couple options. Uh, there's a device called the Fosgometer, a software called Fikert Adjust Plus. However, these two options are relatively expensive. Fosgometer is about $300 and Adjust Plus is about $400. So um, I called the manufacturers of our test disc and asked what they recommended, and they suggested using a digital multimeter. So I'm going to set this up and show you how to do the measurement. I have my multimeter connected. It's set to millivolts and AC. That's AC, not DC. This is the left channel output in the phono preamp, and I have one probe going inside the output jack and the other one is touching the ground metal on the outside. The test record has two azimuth test tones. One of them is a one kilohertz tone playing in the left channel and the other one is a one kilohertz tone playing in the right channel. Now the idea here is for example if we're playing the right channel tone we want to measure the sound that's bleeding into the left channel known as crosstalk. I'm going to measure the crosstalk in both channels and then try and minimize and make it roughly equal in each channel. 
Okay, let me drop the tone arm here and we'll measure tracks. Okay, now these numbers are relatively high. These readings are in the 240 range, um, which is telling me that the test tone is actually playing in the channel we're measuring, which is not what we want. We want it to play in the opposite channel. In the next track, these numbers will go down quite a bit, and there'll be a range. Uh, the higher numbers in the range will mostly be surface noise, and we're looking for the lowest numbers that we get as we watch the measurements with the next track. This test is actually much easier to do with an old-fashioned analog meter because you don't get the range of readings, but uh, with this meter I could actually use the min-max feature which would measure over a period of time and then just show me the minimum reading. Now when I'm ready to do the opposite channel, I'm going to leave the probes in this output because I don't want to switch outputs and introduce variability that way. What I'll do is I'll take these interconnects and flip them from left to right and then run the measurement again. Now I want to tell you that this is not uh, an adjustment that you should spend two hours on. Give it about 15 or 20 minutes and just get it as close as you can. We're about to tackle the second most confused step in this entire process known as SRA, or stylus rake angle. You may have also heard the term VTA, which is essentially the same thing. To understand this, imagine we have a garden rake. If you lift the back end of the handle, it's going to change the angle at which the teeth dig into the ground. In this case, if you lift the arm, it's going to change the angle at which the stylus meets the surface of the record. Now some people will do this setup using a USB microscope. You get in real close and you set the stylus to a predetermined angle and then you dial in the sound by ear. However, a USB microscope and stand cost about $400 and I find it completely unnecessary to complete in this step. So I'm going to recommend that you use the cartri cartridge manufacturer's recommended starting point. This cartridge has a rectangular body and the manufacturer recommends that you set the bottom edge of the body so that it's completely parallel to the surface of the record. Then you dial it in by ear, and I'm going to show you how to do that now. SRA is all about articulation in your sound. Now that I've raised or lowered the base of my tone arm so that the cartridge body meets the surface of the record in the recommended orientation, I'm ready to dial in the finishing touches by ear. And the way that I do that is using the Fleetwood Mac album, Rumors, the track called Never Going Back Again. I can't play the track, but I'll tell you exactly what I listen for. As the guitar playing moves up the fretboard into the higher frequencies, the harmonics become very abundant. If the tone arm is too high, the harmonics will be rather dull and lifeless. Too low, and they become thin and bright. The sweet spot is when the harmonics just kind of hang in the air and linger. Now don't be surprised if you end up lowering or raising the tone arm much more than you were expecting because sometimes that happens. And bear in mind that if you're not using the most resolving gear, these characteristics are going to be more difficult for you to hear. Regardless of what gear you're using, it does take some practice and experience to learn how to do this well. When selecting a tone arm and cartridge, especially if they're not manufactured by the same company, it's important to check certain specifications to ensure they're a good match. The specifications I'm referring to are the compliance of the tone arm and the effective mass of the cartridge. Compliance refers to the spring or flexibility of the cantilever in the cartridge as it supports the tone arm. Think of it kind of like the springs on an automobile. The easiest way to make sure you get this right is to either ask the tone arm manufacturer what range of compliance they recommend in a cartridge or ask the cartridge manufacturer what range of effective mass they recommend in a tone arm. If you fail to do this matching, you could end up with excessive resonance or vibration at certain frequencies, which will result in distortion and compromised sound quality. If you're curious about the resonance performance of your current setup, there's a track on the test disk that allows you to evaluate this. We'll take a look at that now. There are three possible sources of tone arm resonance. 
sound waves from the speakers, energy from the spinning of the turntable, and the stylus writing on certain frequencies contained in the record. This test tone is a sweep of frequency intervals from 1 kHz to 10 Hz. Watch the cartridge for vibration or movement at each of these frequencies. Records will never contain frequencies below 10 Hz, but to check for turntable vibration below 10 Hz, play the silent groove test track and watch for any cartridge movement. Anti-skate is a fairly simple concept. Have you ever seen a tone arm just go flying or skating across the record? As the platter spins, it generates a force that pulls the tone arm inward. So anti-skate is a magnetic adjustment that we use to try to counteract that force. There's a tone on the test disc, and the way that it works is as the volume of the tone increases, the speakers will emanate a distortion that manifests itself as oscillation. The idea is to try to equalize that distortion in both channels. However, unless you hear some serious anomalies or you have an oscilloscope to view the waveforms, I'd probably just leave it alone. For this last step, we're going to use what's known as a silent groove track on the test record. This is a track that doesn't have any sound. So as the platter spins, my system is on and I'm listening for any sound emanating out of the speakers which could indicate a problem with the turntable bearing, noise coming out of the motor, or something loose on the tone arm. Now another way we can use this track is to test for any sound transference coming through the turntable. Remember, when we started, I mentioned that it's important to set your turntable on a solid base. So if I tap the base like this, I shouldn't hear any sound. I'll also tap on the phono preamp and parts of the table. And I like to use something hard like this to tap with higher frequencies. Basically, I'm just going to go around here. And I, want, I don't want to hear any noise at all. If all I hear is silence, then everything is good. Now that we've completed all the setup steps, I want to go over a few tips for when you start playing records. The first thing I do when I put an album on is brush off any dust. And I've tried just about every record brush out there, and I've settled on this one from Hunt Ida. These are fairly common, they cost about $30, and the thing that really works well with this one is the velvet strip across the center. It prevents any dust from going through. I'll just set that on there for a couple revolutions and then slowly pull it off to the side. This is not a substitute for a record cleaner, but it does remove a lot of dust and dirt. Once the surface of the record is clean, the next thing we need to do is clean the stylus. This is the Zero Dust from Anzao. And uh, the best place to buy these is on eBay. You get them for about half price, $30. It's just a little sticky pad. And it's the same thing. You just have to barely touch the stylus with this one. Uh, either one of these by themselves would be perfectly sufficient. Usually I'll take the uh, magic eraser when I start playing records. And then when I change to the next one, I'll pull this one out. This third device is optional. Um, this is a zero stat multi for uh, discharging static electricity from the album. The reason why I say it's optional is because these cost about $100, so if you have a $500 turntable, it doesn't really make sense. But for higher end systems, um, I know some people who have bought devices where you put the album in there to release the static electricity, they cost about $1,500. But the problem I found with those is that um, just playing an album builds up static from the stylus uh, on the surface and um, about three, two or three songs and you're pretty much back where you were. The nice thing about this is you can hit it while the album's playing. The way it works is you just pull the lever toward you and then slowly release it. Listen for that second click. All you have to do is 
hit the surface a couple times and then hit the cartridge and maybe around the turntable. And lastly, I want to mention the cartridge protector. This is very important, especially if you're using an expensive cartridge. The only time this is not on my cartridge is when I'm playing records or when I'm doing some sort of setup. Um, you do want to pay close attention when you're putting it on because it's been known to happen that people have broken their cantilever trying to put the thing on and not watching what they're doing. That's pretty much it. Thank you.